Hello, everybody. For anyone who is joined us a little early or, or perhaps exactly on time, um, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Juliet. I'm going to be one of your main facilitators tonight. We're going to go ahead and give it a few minutes. Uh, I know that some folks are still trying to register and log in. So hold tight. Thank you. And again, for those of you who maybe are still joining us, uh, welcome. We are going to give it a few extra minutes to let everyone register uh, and um, be able to join the conversation tonight. So just hang tight. One more time for those of you who are just joining, I'm going to give it one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. There's still a few people trying to get in. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and get started tonight. So once again, my name is Juliet Vong with HBB Landscape Architecture. I will be one of your uh, main facilitators for the discussion tonight. Our agenda, uh, we're going to spend some time talking, uh, giving you a little bit of background on the project. Um, uh, in case you, no one quite realized, we're, we're Greg Cuyo Park and Greenways. So uh, if you're expecting something different, you might be in the wrong webinar. Um, we're going to give you some context and a little bit of site analysis. Uh, we spent a lot of time at our first open house um, going over these items. This is our second open house for the project. Um, so we are going to go ahead and also talk about um, some of what we heard at those previous um, events and outreach events. Uh, then we're going to go into a series of alternatives and ask you a bunch of questions. This is the more interactive part of our meeting. We'll, we'll present some different ideas and alternatives and then ask you to give us some feedback. Uh, and then we'll have a good chunk of time at the end for just questions um, and comments. Um, we're going to reserve a little bit of time at the very end of this meeting just to give you some input and some information on how you can stay informed and uh, what our next steps are going to be. Um, so as I said, I'm with HBB Landscape Architecture. We are consultants working uh, for the city, um, so supporting them and developing the concepts and, and um, helping work through this process for the project. Um, we uh, are based out of Seattle. We've done a fair amount of work all around the region and up and down the Puget Sound area. Um, but we certainly defer to you, the community and the city for uh, a lot of what is um, the, the best knowledge for what's in your backyard and, and what is really um, uh, on the ground. We've been out to the site numerous times. Uh, we have a lot of experts as part of our team. 
uh, in wetlands and streams in biological sciences, um, also in engineering and a lot of other resources to draw from so that ultimately we can kind of develop a plan that both uh, responds to the interests and the, the um, uh, feedback we get from the community as well as has a good basis in, in reality and what really makes sense for the site. So Jen, I'm gonna turn that over to you to do some of the introductions for the city. Okay, awesome, thank you. And thank you everybody for being here. We're really excited um, about this project and to have the community be engaged in such a meaningful way. So really appreciate you being here tonight. I know it's a sunny summer evening. Um, we're really glad that you decided to, sh to share it with us here for this project. Um, before I toss it over to Ashley, I want to thank our public affairs department. They have just worked tirelessly to help us with this project. Same with Public Works. They've been just such a great partner um, to us in the Parks, Culture, and Recreation Department, which I'd like to thank my staff who have been involved uh, in the project. And I really want to thank the Board of Park Commissioners uh, who are really making this project a priority this year. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll pass it off to Ashley. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Smith. I'm the Capital Projects Manager with the city. And I'm here representing Public Works. Happy to be here and as part of this project. And Merit, also with HPB, why don't you introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Merit Ovier with HPB Landscape Architecture. Uh, very excited to be here, excited to be part of this master plan. Um, my daily activities involve just uh, managing this project on a daily basis to move it through this master planning process. And then also behind the scenes with us, uh, we have Kelly with the city. If you see her name up there, she's supporting uh, in the sort of the logistics and, and the technical support with running the meeting. And then Julia is part of our team as well. Julia, why don't you chime on and say hi. When we get into the more active engagement, you're gonna see her. She's gonna walk us through some of the live polls and some of the questions we have to get some feedback from the, from the group. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. A uh, couple of logistics starting out, um, I guess before the logistics, um, there is, a, I guess, a special acknowledgement for those of you who may not be aware of who Greg Cuyo is. Jen? Yeah, so thanks. Um, on March 3rd, 2011, the city finalized the purchase of 400 acres in North Lacey to be preserved for passive recreation, educational opportunities, trails, water resources, and ecological habitat. With this acquisition, the city created the largest municipal park system within Thurston County. Shortly after, City Council honored Greg Cuyo upon his retirement by naming the parkland after him in recognition of his 24 years of public service and contributions to the community as Lacey's city manager. So Greg was really instrumental in negotiating and securing this land purchase, uh, which would eventually become the city's largest park. And even though Greg is retired from the city manager role for Lacey, he still is a very active member of the Lacey community. Um, I know he was at our first workshop. I don't believe he's here tonight, but if he does happen to pop on, we want to definitely thank him for all of his efforts and for still volunteering, you know, even to this day through Lacey Rotary and also personal um, volunteer efforts as well. So thank you, Greg. Okay, uh, so our meeting format tonight a Zoom meeting. Many of you are probably aware and have been through this a number of times. I think we all feel we're getting close to not having to do Zoom meetings anymore. So um, that's super exciting for all of us. Um, whether it's a Zoom meeting or an in-person meeting, our guidelines are still the same. Um, we'll be guiding the discussion tonight. Uh, we want to try and have fun as much as we can in this format and get some active participation. So we've orchestrated a number of pauses throughout this meeting to be able to do some live polling and start to get some um, immediate feedback on sentiments and interests um, from the group. You are all muted. Um, and when we get to the QA portion at the end, what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna use the Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen. So if you don't see it right off the bat, if you move your mouse around or hover with your finger a little, you should see it pop up. There's a little Q&A button. Um, you can input both questions and comments in that Q&A window. Uh, and that'll help us at any point during the, the meeting and the discussion, you can kind of log and track any comments or discussion points that you'd like to have. When we get to the Q&A portion towards the end, we're gonna use that as our basis to guide that discussion. So we'll start kind of looking at the questions that you may have had, the comments that people wanna raise. We'll respond to some of them directly. Others, we're gonna try and just um, unmute you 
you. So we'll basically mic you. Um, I'll give you some notice. I'll say, hey, John Doe, uh, it looks like you had some great interest and in some comments. Uh, we're going to give you a chance to say to speak directly to the group. That'll be your cue. Uh, you can always, you know, unmute yourself when we give you the cue uh, and say no, thank you at this time. Um, uh, or you can also just put in that, put it in that cue, you know, no thanks. Um, we want everyone to feel comfortable with how they interact with us, how they provide feedback. Uh, and we're certainly going to try and give you as many opportunities and different, um, different ways to provide that feedback and engage. So um, that's our Q&A button. Um, there is also a closed captioning button. Uh, so if uh, you would like to be able to read along with the discussion, you can click that button. Again, if you hover, you should see that at the bottom. It's the bottom of my screen. It is at the top of the screen, depending on what format you're in and what device you're using. Um, and I think really the, one of the most important elements of this is, is just to be patient. <laughs> We're going to uh, do our best to kind of get through comments and discussion points um and and to listen to hear what interests you have and, and what you think about some of the ideas that we're going to present tonight we ask you to be respectful if you're a person that tends to have lots of conversations and lots of opinions to say that's great we want to hear them but don't forget to step back um, and we'll also allow some other folks to have um, have the floor so if i don't call on you um, it is only because we're trying to kind of or make sure we hear from very varied opinions um, and different views and different points of views and of course, at the very end of the day, all ideas matter. We're gonna take your feedback from today and we're gonna kind of try to refine these ideas. Um, and ultimately our goal is to get towards a preferred master plan. Um, so important to start off with, with this meeting, as well as after this meeting and leading up to it, the website, uh, which you can see the link and also the QR code is one of the best ways to stay involved um, and to stay up to date on information regarding the project. So we're posting meeting notices, events, um, summaries as we get them available. It can take us a while to get some summaries out. So, so again, please be patient with us, but you will see those summaries get posted and, and, um, and be able to see the feedback that we've received to date. If you are not already on our project list, you can get added to the project list um, in order by, by emailing lacyparks at ci.lacy.wa.us. Um, all right, park vision. So one of the things we really talked about at the beginning of this, um, the last meeting was was the, the master plan itself, um, the kind of conditions that are out there, the super unique environment that this park really is, um, and what a treasure it is to the people who, who live nearby, but also to the city as a whole, who may not realize that this is something they can really eventually come to um, and really learn from. And so out of a lot of that feedback, um, the, the vision for the city uh, for this park and for this open space is to is really centered on preservation. Um, we want to preserve the unique habitat that's there. Um, we want to uh, recognize the water quality protection and enhancement of that natural environment. Um, and, and part of that, the, the sort of other side of that is balancing that protection of the natural environment with recreation opportunities. And so ultimately we want this to be a place for, for visitors, for residents, for people to be able to understand unique, the unique nature of this, experience it and learn about it. Um, and then potentially even apply that to other elements of their lives. So we're gonna look at that and accomplish that. Um, there's a number of goals. I'm not gonna read through all of the goals. You can kind of take a look yourself. Um, I will also say that as we go through this presentation, there might be things that you can't necessarily read um, depending on your screen size. That's okay. We'll talk through the important parts and then we will post this presentation. Um, it's a PDF so you'll be able to zoom in on a screen and really kind of be able to see all those various elements in, in greater detail if you'd like to after the meeting. Um, Jen, I think there was maybe kind of a little bit about just the value of parks to the recreation system, and I'll give you a chance to talk about that here. Yeah, thanks, Juliet. Um, yeah, I would, I would like to chime in. I feel I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to really make the connection between this type of a project and the, you know, the type of open space and also recreation programs that can exist there and um, tie that really to why the City Park and Recreation and Culture Department exists. Uh, and so there's many benefits, um, you know, I think health and wellness comes to mind as the biggest benefit uh, right off the bat of having park and rec opportunities. But there's also, um, you know, the component of equity and access for people to public lands. Um, there's also, 
environmental benefits, uh, cleaning the air, providing resilience to the community. Um, there's economic benefits that parks and recreation opportunities can offer. Um, that it provides, it can provide, um, you know, money to the area uh, and helps with a thriving city. It also can create job opportunities. Um, one of the big things too that I really like about park and recreation opportunities is just the increase of community engagement and just, you know, the community coming together to do volunteer opportunities and maybe gardening and other things um, together as a community unit. And I think that, you know, <clears throat> these benefits have really been highlighted a lot more with the pandemic and just people just having a renewed uh, appreciation for park open spaces and recreation and cultural opportunities. So that's all just kind of wanted to add my two cents there. <laughs> Thank you. And I think that's a good foundation as we move through this, we're gonna show you kind of knots of areas that are protected, areas that are, are proposed for recreational opportunities. Um, and, um, and we'll kind of, you know, again, a lot of today is gonna to be trying to find the balance between um, what feels right uh, and allowing those opportunities to occur within a natural environment. So we go to the next slide. It kind of brings us to what is a master plan and in some ways, what, it, what is not a master plan. Um, so master plans are really expressing a long-term vision. So we wanna understand what kinds of activities people could do. Um, we start to get into where we think they would occur best on the site. We've looked at what areas of the site are kind of the highest quality and should really be completely preserved and what areas maybe are not as high of a quality. And, and some of these program opportunities can actually allow the, the, um, the, the improvement of some of the habitat and the areas around it through that development process. Um, so we're gonna look at the different activities. Um, and then what we do is we start to apply the infrastructure, the circulation, uh, utilities, walkways, parking, you know, we'll kind of de develop a lot of that infrastructure. How big is it? Where does it go? How is it gonna interact? Um, and how does it relate to these other elements of the site? And ultimately what we're doing is we're guiding that future implementation. It is not super precise. We are at like a 10,000 foot level. So it's that bird's eye view coming through. Um, we've had a lot of boots on the ground, but we've not identified and, um, and defined every single wetland limit throughout the whole site. We've certainly walked every quadrant in every corner of it, but there is a lot of work to be done in the future. So um, as we've already heard from some community members who have done Audubon societies, have done some, some bird um, uh, inventories and some adjacent residents have done wetland studies that extended into the park and, and all of those are welcome to kind of help us continue to plan and refine these ideas based on the site specific conditions. So where are we at in the world? Um, so you can see here the city of Lacey boundary in that kind of orangish color and I-5 um, cuts, you know, sort of more or less through the middle. Um, the red highlighted area is our project boundary. It is called the Gray Cuyo Park and Greenways for a reason. So as we zoom in a little bit closer on this next slide, uh, you can see the red boundary in a little greater detail. You see Carpenter Road um, bisects our um, our area and our park. Um, and then you have Hawks Prairie to the north. Uh, you have I-5 and the Gateway neighborhood to the south. Um, and the, the park is made up of multiple parcels. So I think one of the questions um, was sort of is, is the park the whole 400 acres? We have uh, a little over 500 acres, I think, total. Um, and it is made up of Greg Cuyo Park, which you see in the darkest green. Uh, we also have Pleasant Glade Park, which is its own park in that sort of medium shade of green and the Palm Creek Headwaters. Uh, within the Gray Cuyo Park, there are two parcels um, or two areas if defined in blue. Those are protected water rights conservation. So those have probably the, the most limiting factor on um, what we can do within those sites because those are intended for protection. Uh, we also have some RCO, um, which is the Recreation and Conservation Office. We have um, from the state, we have some grant money that was used to purchase some properties, Pleasant Glade um, Park, as well as part of Great Cuyo Park. So there are uh, some other kind of limitations with um, some of the property purchase and the acquisition. Um, they still allow recreation opportunities, but we, it's just one layer of information as we start to develop the master plan. And so when we say Greg Cuyo Park in general, we mean the park and greenways. We're talking about all three of those areas combined. 
Uh, we spent a lot of time early in this project going through and really identifying what's existing on this site. Our first open house spent a fair amount of time um, kind of presenting that information, looking at photos and sort of defining the different characteristics and qualities of different parts of the park. Um, we're not going to go through that in detail, but if you're interested, you can go to the project website and, and look through that background information. Um, what I did do is I listed all the things that we did look at as part of that analysis. So you see that RCO down towards the bottom. Uh, we have a funding from RCO WWRP stands for Wildlife Recreation and, and Pro Parks, I think, Protection. Program. <laughs> program, thank you, program. Um, and, and all of the other elements that we did look at. If you look at the map really quickly, quickly, just as a nutshell, you can kind of see um, the orange represents a 300 foot wetland buffer. These are wetland areas. They are not all defined wetlands. So it again, we're, because we're at a high enough level, it doesn't mean that there aren't wetlands in other areas of the site. Uh, and there could also be some of these areas defined that turn out to not be wetlands. Essentially, as a project or a phase one or as a future design starts to get implemented over time, each area would have more detailed analysis, more detailed survey, delineations of those environmental features, and refinement of that design as you go through each phase of improvement. Again, we're talking about a 20-year vision, um, and within that vision, between this meeting and the next meeting, we'll start to try and define what that first phase or most important priority project might be. The green represents the shoreline. Uh, buffer and the orange represents that 300 foot wetland buffer and that's the greatest amount of buffer that's required by the city's code. Okay, Merritt, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about the summary of our previous engagement. Thank you, Juliet. Um, so yeah, um, a next handful of slides will provide a brief overview of what we've heard so far. And open house number one uh, was held in mid-May. Uh, it was focused on site analysis, visioning, uh, and we were seeking input from adjacent um, residents, community members, and park users uh, on the long-term vision for the park. Uh, the open house was well attended. We had 98 participants at the online open house, and we received 113 comments through the Q&A window. And uh, the word cloud right in the middle provides uh, at a quick glance overview of what some of the preferred programmatic elements and the desired activities by the open house attendees were. Um, the word cloud, the words that uh, are mentioned more times get bigger and bigger, whereas others get a little bit smaller. Uh, what we also heard were uh, a few concerns, and one of the bigger concerns related to park development was increased traffic through adjacent neighborhoods, also safety and maintenance related concerns were mentioned. We also did some live polling for more immediate feedback during the first open house, and uh, the four images on this slide um, provide a quick overview of the questions and answers uh, we received. So the open house attendees uh, generally um, preferred for connections uh, internal to the uh, park site to loop trails and, and less, were less favorable of connect, having connections to uh, adjacent neighborhoods. The highest ranked priorities at the top right, top right um, were uh, recreation, play, adventure, and conservation of natural environment with trails and also opportunities for uh, passive recreation. Uh, bottom right is what most resonated with open house attendees was uh, to create a space for passive recreational activities that conserve the natural environment, but also allow and support play and adventure. And this is a great example where we don't expect you to read all the detail of this, but if you go onto the website, we have a lot of that detail in the summary. You can, you can kind of look through and uh, more on your own. And while uh, open house number one for, was focused on visioning, uh, we asked the local community uh, to provide input on what kinds of programmatic and programming and activities they would like to see in the park. Uh, some of the activities desired were mentioned many times and others popped up occasionally. 
So that kind of uh, uh, drove the identification of what some of the preferred programming elements are and versus what are some of the more optional programming elements. So as you can see on the left, uh, preferred programming elements um, uh, from the first open house were activities related to trails, nature viewing and play. Uh, allowing for picnic areas, educational opportunities, uh, while protecting habitat was also preferred. And uh, optional programming includes uh, items listed on the right hand side, uh, mountain biking, disc golf, off leash area, pickleball, fitness, etc. At the open house, uh, event, uh, the online survey went live and it remained open for about a month after the open house itself. And that allowed us to gain additional input uh, from local community. We had total of 251 participants and uh, 65 of those lived within city of Lacey and 42% uh, uh, lived in the adjacent neighborhoods. 49% uh, of participants included households with children under age 18, and 44% were uh, over the age of 55. And all of this um, is in line with City of Lacey uh, overall demographic as well. Uh, we also asked uh, for feedback on preferences and priorities for programming, as well as guiding principles. And uh, on those graphs, orange indicates uh, the very important rating, uh, rating and the green indicates uh, not important. So as you interpret those graphs, um, at the top of the graph are items that are ranked or were ranked as being more important to survey respondents and towards the bottom of those graphs, um, the items that were ranked as less important. And just to highlight a few highest ranked programming elements um, on the left, um, we had hiking trails, nature viewing, walking, biking trails, disc golf, informal activities um, were ranked as more important. From the guiding principles, as you can see, uh, protect, protecting and restoring ecology, ecology, safety and security, and also low maintenance um, for the park were important to the survey respondents. We created a quick word cloud to illustrate uh, valued park aspects from the survey responses. And uh, just to highlight um, a few items 40% of the survey respondents mentioned importance of nature, biodiversity, and having a less developed park. 24% mentioned disc golf as being most sought after feature in the park. 18% uh, of the respondents mentioned trails, which included both paved and unpaved trails to accommodate biking, walking, and um, also keeping in mind um, different needs and abilities of various groups. 11% of respondents like mixed use um, that is geared towards family activities. So overlapping with Greg QEO Park and Greenways online survey, uh, City of Lacey also had a citywide survey open to seek input from local residents on all parks in Lacey. And the survey asked about which programming and uh, what types of amenities uh, would be desired in Lacey Parks uh, in general. So the list on the left uh, highlights the programming elements and the list on the right highlights um, uh, different facilities and amenities. So in addition, City of Lacey has reached out to uh, many groups uh, to include and, and let them know about the project, include them in the conversation, gain, gain feedback and input for this park master plan project. And in addition to the groups uh, listed on this slide, City has also um, 
is receiving, has received, and will continue to receive uh, emails with just general public comment. Um, I do want to ensure that feedback uh, captured through all of those different channels is considered in the design process. And with that, I turn back over to Juliet. So uh, one question we're always asked is what do we do with all this information? Um, so what we've kind of defined here is a little bit about how we take this information and try and turn it into an, an actual plan that you can then look at and tell us, uh, tell us how we did. Um, so the, the top portion of this slide really shows about programming that seemed fairly, um, uh, had a lot of consensus throughout all the various methods of, of input um, and outreach that we've done. So hiking, picnicking, playgrounds, education, walking, biking, nature viewing, those were mentioned um, again and again throughout all of our, uh, all of our feedback. Um, and then the guiding principles of kind of the ones that came uh, that came to the top of the list as well. So then that doesn't mean that the ones that were closer to the bottom of that list um, weren't, uh, aren't at all considered. It is just a matter of, of really thinking about how much space and how, how much of those other types of uses really fit within Gray Cuyo Park and Greenways. And so those are the, um, the bottom half of this are those types of activities that are more varied. They are either varied in size, some concepts include them, some don't include them at all. Um, uh, and so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is kind of focused on the bottom half of this to try to see where is that right balance for this particular park. And the other thing I'll also mention is, is you know, there are others. This is, a, this is a point in time. Even if it's a year-long process, it's still a single point in time in a 20-year vision. So there is always um, a, kind of a, an understanding as you go to develop each phase of a park, there's more public process, there's more interest, communities change, identities and characteristics, values sometimes change. And so even as we define a, a preferred master plan here, each area that gets developed will have some additional process um, and additional refinement. So it's still not really set in stone until you get to that final design phase. Um, we asked you in the last meeting, what kinds of examples, where are the precedents, where are places you've been that you think would be good examples and inspiration for this park? And so we just wanted to kind of take a nod to some of the places that you told us were important or you thought were pretty cool and relevant. So Tolmy State Park was one mentioned quite a bit, um, a very natural environment, you know, kind of a very softer, um, not highly developed, uh, lots of education, lots of wildlife. So you can kind of see in these photos why this was reminded um, of people when you think about Great Cuyo Park. Uh, the next one is the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. So it's the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. Um, this one was mentioned a lot. Uh, we talk about education a fair amount. Education came up a lot at our last open house and it's been brought up um, by, by lots of different groups and agencies and, and peoples of the people of the public. Um, and so you kind of just see some photos there about wetlands and habitat and value and the types of what I love about this photo at the top too is, is ways you can sort of, again, find the balance. Here's a trail that goes through a wetland in a natural system, but by elevating it, you're really doing the best you can to protect the environment around it. So you can still see it, but you're not getting your feet wet. You're not getting, you're not encouraging people to kind of disturb those shorelines, but still allowing the educational value for it. This was a great example that, that was mentioned. And then I think we have one more here uh, with the Woodard Bay Conservation Area. Um, a little bit different character and a little bit of a different sort of background, but you can also kind of see from particularly the photo at the top, just that environment of a natural trail um, kind of and, and the views and, and the ability to experience the natural environment. And I liked the photo at the bottom too, because again, it shows a small gathering area that, you know, having people be able to gather um, and have some, some, some element of recreational um, value uh, is not exclusive to some of these places and that it can really support and teach people what and why we're, we're protecting the places that we're protecting. Um, okay, just a nod to our vision. I'm not going to read it again, don't worry. <laughs> just a reminder as we move into this next phase of the project, um, our presentation is going to now focus on concepts and alternatives themselves. So let's move into it. Um, it's, I think what's one of my favorite slides coming up here. So our monsters. Um, 
uh, we like to say it's really easy to sort of think about a concept A, B, and C. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of times projects might just ask you to pick a concept. Um, this is a really unique site. Uh, we have a diverse number of interests. We have a diverse environment throughout the whole park. It's a very large park. We're not really going to ask you, and, and we're not going to ever ask you to pick concept A, B, or C, or even tell us what you like best about concept A, B, or C as a whole. Um, at the end of the day, we really feel that uh, in order to make this project successful, we're going to end up with a little bit of A, a little bit of C, and a little bit of, of B. I think I missed B in the middle there. Um, or we might end up with a whole lot of A and just an arm and, a, and, a, and an eye um, of, of the rest of them. And so the idea here is you remember all, like when we're all little, those little flip books, um, we want to mix and match. And so we'll have this crazy mix up of, of what feels like the right balance to us at the end. I'm gonna use that slide everywhere from now on. Um, so we have three concepts. We did label them A, B, and C. Uh, we are not gonna go through them in great detail. I just wanted to give you a snapshot um, of the overall. And what we're gonna actually do is we're gonna zoom into certain elements of each of these concepts as we go through the presentation. So by the end, you'll understand and what's in each of these. Um, and to start that off, I just wanted to do a simplified matrix. So really the core value of this that I wanna express is that all of our concepts protect and restore the environment. Um, we are not gonna build anything that is not, uh, that doesn't that, that um, doesn't feel safe, um, that isn't secure, that um, is not supported by maintenance. Um, uh, but the, the concepts do vary and they vary in terms of sort of circulation and access. Um, they vary with the types of programs and activities that we have, um, and they vary with cost effectiveness. So in, you know, cost effective and low maintenance don't always go hand in hand, but the more you build, the more you maintain. And so to some degree, um, there's a little bit of relationship there. Uh, in, in order to walk us through what is very complex and try to break it into some reasonable pieces, uh, we've separated all of our program um, areas uh, and discussion points by topic. So these are the topics we're going to walk through. And we're going to pause with each of these and have a little bit of a, of a, of a short um, break of me talking uh, and give you a chance to give us some feedback. So this first one is uh, access and circulation. Um, we broke this into primary paths and secondary paths. Um, park access, of course, refers to you know, where you can actually enter into the park, kiosks, play areas, picnic areas. Um, there's parking in some cases and not in others. Um, and so what kinds of, of activities you might wanna have right at those entrances to the park. Primary paths tend to be wider. Uh, we've shown about eight to 12 feet. And the reason they're wider is both for maintenance access but also for emergency vehicles. They don't have to be paved. I think both photos might show paved, but the idea is they don't have to be. They are often paved in the core um, area. So where you have the most intense use, those are often paved for ease of maintenance and for uh, ADA accessibility. But, but as you move beyond that core area, they're often might still be a little bit wider to get the access for the vehicle uh, maintenance and, and um, emergency vehicles, but they don't always have to be paved. And then secondary paths scale down from that are usually not paved, um, although they might be boardwalks through in sensitive areas. And then we're not even showing the third tier. There's sort of a third tier of more informal trails. Uh, those would certainly exist throughout the park, but it is at such a finite scale that we really just don't even get into it in a master plan process. So it doesn't preclude it just because we're not showing it. So uh, essentially what we're showing here, and you'll get to this a little bit later, is the yellow shows the primary paths that we've defined for each of these three concepts. What we basically looked at is creating a major trail system that connects all the majority, um, the, the larger the entrances, um, uh, and uh, kind of creates at least one loop through the whole park. Uh, we're going to ask you some questions about multiple loops that you could then add on to this and create um, beyond what we're showing here. So major act entrance we expect off of Carpenter. We'll show that in some greater details we get later into the slide, but we would expect anybody who's driving really to come first and foremost to that entrance off of Carpenter. Um, there's an open space that's there now if you're driving by um, that you see where agriculture use used to happen on west side of Carpenter, that's where we really have defined the core area of improvements. 
Um, beyond that is primarily trails and different programming activities that occur through the trails. Two secondary entrances we have identified here is one at Pleasant Glade, responding to the original master plan that showed an access point and there's some um, existing improvements there now. And then the second one is off of the 31st Avenue extension, and we'll show that a little bit more later as well. Um, other areas that we've defined beyond that where we might reach out or have opportunities to connect to public roadways um, that are around the park itself. Um, and we'll, we'll talk and show you some of those as well. Um, those would be really uh, intended as neighborhood access points. Um, anybody driving to the park would be coming to these primary ones. Those secondary ones are really just for maybe a maintenance vehicle access that needs to, to come in to help maintain it or to provide some security. Um, it could be for ADA accessibility. You know, sometimes you might live in a neighborhood, but grandma wants to take little Susie to the neighborhood park or a tot lot or to have a picnic and she just can't walk the whole way, but could actually park in an ADA stall and still experience it. So that's that kind of scale of neighborhood park where you're not providing a significant number of parking, but you still have some accessibility. And we'll show you where those are in one of these next slides. Okay, let's move on to this. So trail programming, there's a number of different things you can do along these trails that we're envisioning and that we're gonna ask you about. So we've got areas for mountain biking. And when we think mountain biking, we're thinking kind of family mountain biking. We're not talking like highly technical, super detailed trails or a super extensive trail system. We're talking about an area that families and people who don't aren't as, as advanced can actually learn and still experience it. So it might be where you go to kind of teach your kids how to ride a mountain bike before you sort of try to take them into the more um, the more backcountry areas. Um, disc golf, both an 18 hole as well as the potential for a, a gold level course um, beyond the 18 holes in the future, interpretive signs and education elements, trail events. So we've heard a lot about a need for cross country meets and to be able to hold cross country meets in the South End that just aren't available now. Um, as well as uh, hosting fun runs and, and charity events and benefit runs, those kinds of things. And so those need some space to gather and start and they need some space to have those routes defined. Our next slide. Okay, so we're starting with disc golf to kind of show you where that disc golf expand the areas were defined. So again, the bulk of the 18 holes, which would be an initial um, uh, kind of the priority to initially invest would be uh, in that core area. The core area is defined by the white boundary you see in the center of each of these different images. Um, so what's outlined in yellow is uh, that the disc golf, and it happens along the primary trails and secondary trails. So essentially it follows the trail system and you have a, a, a disc golf hole, a tee and a, and a basket just off of that trail. Um, so it stays pretty well contained within those zones. Um, all of our trails uh, fall, like none of them are developed going through wetlands in these areas. We skirt around edges of wetlands and skirt around edges of buffers, but we don't really uh, anticipate needing to cut through any in these areas. There are some other areas of the park where in order to connect all the way from Pleasant Glade up to 31st, we might have to cut through some of those sensitive areas and we certainly have some creek crossings. The other question we really have here is that 18 hole expansion. So long Long term, there's a need to really um, develop a, a tournament level um, disc golf in the South End. Um, and this, this site has been identified as a really prime uh, potential to do that because it is a low impact activity uh, that does happen within those trail systems. And so we've looked at three different um, or two different locations for where that 18 hole expansion could be. So in option A, it's over kind of closer to Pleasant Glade. Um, in options B and C, it would be more in the forested area on the east side. And so we're going to ask you in a few minutes what you think about those different alternatives. The next slide focuses on mountain biking. Um, so mountain biking in ropes or zip line type courses. So what we've focused in here is the area in the northeast quadrant of the park. So you see 31st Avenue um, uh, kind of follows uh, in, the in the extension of 31st Avenue through the park to Carpenter Road is that white line you see that bisects the park to the, the north and the south. So all of this is on that north side of that, car, of that 31st Avenue extension. Um, it's a single kind of defined route. You would have a little bit of an open space at either end just so you can kind of gather and meet up and then have a trail that would be designated for mountain bikes, whereas the rest of the trails would not. Um, and it doesn't, we also don't want to cross any of our creeks with that mountain bike use. So it kind of stays contained within an upland open space area. 
Um, the other option in here in option B that we're showing is uh, the addition of a zip line. So this would be something up in the canopy. This would only be preceded if there was a partner who was able to really help the city maintain, operate, um, uh, and run that that event um, or that that type of a facility, and that could either be a zip line or ropes course. So there'd be um, parking would kind of be centered within the area off of 31st. It would be a designated sort of thing that you would be able to sign up for and kind of run similar to like a vendor type process. And we're gonna again we're gonna go through a series of questions to ask you what you think about these. Um, so stay tuned. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia, and I am excited to be taking you through some engagement here. Uh, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen in just a moment, and hopefully you all can see it. Um, and we have sort of a warm-up question to get ourselves started. Um, so what I'll encourage you all to do is to go to www.menti.com. Um, you can do it on your browser on your computer or on your smartphone, um, and type in this little uh, four, or excuse me, eight-digit code here, um, and you should pull up um, a screen that allows you to answer this question with, with all seven of these options here. Um, so we're gonna go through several of these questions throughout this presentation. Um, this is one of the ways that you can help impact the outcome of this planning process is by contributing your input here. Um, so I we'll see one say, person. Oh, go ahead, yeah, Julia. Yeah, I was just gonna also say, um, if for whatever reason you don't have the ability to go to uh, menti.com or it's just, you know, it's not working very well on your system because not all systems quite work the same. Um, you can also just put your responses in the in the, the Q&A field, just kind of put it in similar to like how you would you would react to a chat and then we can kind of track and do this. It's an informal sort of survey. We're just trying to get a snapshot of your opinions and beliefs now. These same questions will be part of a public survey that will be available online as well. So we'll, we'll, we're gonna actually ask you to do it twice. We want you to kind of give us some feedback so we can see what your perceptions are as we talk about us through today. But we will also ask you to kind of go into that, um, the online survey as well. So we can track those responses with a much wider audience as well. I love so, watching the dots fly through, it's my favorite. <laughs> I know, right, it's so fun. Um, and thanks, Julia, that's a really good reminder. But yes, this is, you'll see these questions again on the survey, um, but this is just to make it a little bit more engaging for now and to give us some of that real-time feedback. Um, so great, I'm seeing down here in the bottom right-hand corner that we've got 20 folks who've answered. You can select multiple options, which it looks like people have, because those numbers sum up to more than 20. Um, so great, I'm seeing the city newsletter emails, a way that a lot of folks are getting information. Um, so one other reminder before I move us on to our next question, and we're gonna do a series of three questions before I'll pass it back to Juliet, um, is that if for some reason you get off track, um, you know, if your screen doesn't refresh or you've gotten stuck on an old question, um, there should be a little warning up at the top of your screen that says, oh, the presenter has shifted to a different slide. Um, so you can just go ahead and refresh or, or click that button up there that will hopefully catch you back up to where we're at later in the presentation. And when we're done with this little segment, don't close your browser because we're going to come back to it again a number of times throughout the, the evening tonight. Great. Thanks, Julia. Yes, you will see some foggy trees, uh, which will indicate that it's a work in progress, but there's no questions of that kind. So good. I'm seeing about uh, half of our folks have responded to this question. That is super exciting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move us on to our next question. So hopefully you're all seeing uh, a new uh, screen and a new question uh, pop up on your device, however you're responding with this survey here. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, feel free to add it in as, into the Q&A box and we can try to address that there. Um, but this is really a, a question to what Juliet was just sharing about the different options we have for designing this trail system. Um, so we can design it either as a single primary loop that connects Pleasant Glade Park and the new 31st Ave extension, um, to the central programming area, or we can have multiple primary trail loops um, within each of the main areas of the park uh, that we looked at on that map earlier. Um, and so I'm seeing a lot of support for multiple loops, which is really exciting. It's always fun to see um, consensus from, from a large group, but we do see some other folks who are not so sure. Um, maybe, you know, can see some upsides to both. Um, and a good 11% of folks who are interested in that primary loop. So I'll hang out here for just another five or 10 seconds and then move us on to our next question, which will be about disc golf. Cool, all right, thanks everyone. 
So this next question here is talking about the disc golf expansion. Um, so regardless, this is sort of separate from this question, we know that disc golf is getting proposed along the primary um, and some of the secondary trails in the central activity area of the park, and that we've got about 18 holes identified there. Um, so this question is really getting at a long-term um, sort of future expansion of the disc golf um, to include an additional 18 holes for a full gold level course. Um, so go ahead and take a look here. We've got two potential places where that disc golf expansion could take place, um, either east of Carpenter Road on the right-hand side of the map there, uh, or at Pleasant Blade in sort of the, the southwest corner there. Um, and I'm seeing so kind of as these blobs, but in reality, it's, you know, it's a trail with kind of a, you know, a little bit of a step off to the side to kind of have those disc golf holes. So we're not, it's, it's a within the trees kind of, um, of activity, not a remove the trees and build something activity for those of you who might not be familiar with disc golf. Perfect. Thanks, Juliet. Yes, that is a great point. Um, it will be integrated with the trail system as well. Um, so it will be not a major impact. Um, so I'm seeing some sort of division here of opinion, which is always interesting as well. Um, more interest, you know, in terms of the geographic areas, the most interest with East of Carpenter Road, um, but that's tied in terms of the number of people uh, who, are, who are interested in it being at that, you know, just having no, no expansion or in, at neither of these areas. Um, so we would love to hear when we go into the survey, um, we will have opportunities to add additional input. Um, for those of you who say no, none of the above or no opinion, um, we would love to hear your thoughts on why none of the above or what makes you have no opinion on where this would be. So just that you're not going to use it or you're okay with either. Um, we'd love to hear that in the survey. Juliet, any other thoughts on this one before I move on to mountain biking? Nope, I think this is great. Cool. All right. Um, and thanks everybody for your participation. I'm, I'm really excited to see 32 people um, doing this. This is always one of my favorite parts of public meetings. Uh, so this is the last question we have uh, for right now. We will return to some of this engagement later in the presentation, uh, but our last in this current series. Um, and this is a question about mountain biking. So in addition to the secondary trails that we have proposed, um, the trail system in the northeast corner of the park is going to include some opportunity for mountain biking, as Juliet mentioned. Um, and this, again, is going to be pretty beginner level, sort of geared toward families and individuals who have less experience. Um, and might not yet be comfortable with more technical trails. So this is not some you know, intensive mountain biking retreat. Um, so we know that mountain biking is gonna be included in the Northeast corner of the park under all alternatives or is being proposed to be, um, but we could also include either zip line and or a ropes course uh, in the canopy above the trails. Um, and as Juliet mentioned, this again would be uh, with the participation or would be facilitated by an external partner who'd be able to make sure it's safe and maintain this area. Um, so this question is really about whether you prefer just mountain bike trails uh, or if you'd like zip lining and or a ropes course. Um, and we can, you can select as many as apply here. So for example, if you'd like, you know, zip lining, mountain bikes and a ropes course, um, you can select both, you know, this one up here and this one down here. So I'm seeing about 26 people have responded um, and I'm seeing the most passion for just uh, mountain bike trails. Um, so it sounds like that is really the, the, the opportunity that's most exciting to people. Um, but I'm seeing also some interest in ropes course, a little bit of interest in zip lining, um, and a lot of folks who have no opinion or are not sure. Um, I might guess that some of the people who aren't sure maybe don't anticipate using any of these. Um, but again, that's something we would love to hear a little bit more about, um, more from you about uh, in that survey. All right, so we're going to return to some engagement a little bit later. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll for now and uh, turn back over to the presentation, but thanks all for playing. That was super fun for me. I hope it was for you too. All right, Merritt's going to jump in here and take us through the next section. We're going to be talking about the informal kinds of recreation activities and educational elements next. Thank you, Juliet. So the three concept alternatives all capture a range of informal passive recreation elements uh, shown in a number of areas within the park limits. And um, those informal passive recreation um, opportunities include uh, picnicking, lawn games, small play areas, and seating gathering um, at various access points uh, of the park um, and also in the central core area. So 
highlighted here on this slide on the three concept alternatives are all the areas where the informal uh, passive recreational opportunities could occur. Most of these activities, um, picnicking, lawn games, as well as larger play areas are focused within the core area or the central programmed area of the park, uh, left of um, or west of Carpenter Road, which is highlighted with a white enlargement box on the map. But in addition, the concepts show opportunities for informal passive recreation at secondary access points um, at Pleasant Glade Park on the left of the graphics on each of those uh, concepts, as well as off of 31st Avenue extension. And at both of these secondary access uh, points, uh, they both allow opportunities to integrate a small play or a gathering area we're also uh, looking at Hawks Prairie Road and uh, an access point from Woodland Creek and Covington, Covington Court, uh, which both could include a few picnic tables, a small play or a gathering area. So keep these areas in mind, because when we get to our more active, the interaction part, we're really thinking about scale, right? So in the central core area, we would see the most and like the biggest open space, the biggest playground. This is where we expect the most people to come. But as you move into Pleasant Glade and 31st, what's that scale? Like how much of these activities really fit those areas? Um, and again, particularly as we go north and south to Hawks Prairie and down in the Woodland Creek, Covington area, those are really intended to be smaller neighborhood access points what makes sense what fits for the right scale there so that's what we're going to come back and ask you about in a little bit yeah actually we're going to ask about it right now so back to julia super a little bit <laughs> <laughs> all right let me make sure i'm sharing my right window all right can somebody give me a nod if this is showing up? great all right so let's move forward then um, so we're going to show you four slides here. They're all going to look really similar. Um, so what I encourage you to do is just to keep a close eye for the circle that's shaded. Um, so Mary just shared with us some of the potential passive recreation activities that we would have at each of these different areas. Um, and so we're going to go through all four of these areas. Um, again, we're not yet talking about this central area. Um, we're going to talk about that later in this presentation. Uh, but this is really about getting at these, these four different areas. So uh, as you're seeing here, I'm seeing some folks are already adding their input. Um, which of the activities would you most like to have available at the 31st Ave Extension, which is right here uh, at the east side of the park? So go ahead and add your ideas. You can select all that apply. I'll give folks a couple minutes to get that in there before I start narrating. Great. I'm seeing a lot of interest in kind of four main activities or opportunities here. The benches, just plain open lawn, uh, picnic tables and shelters and play areas sound like they're some of the most important things. So some of those sort of sort of really like foundational uh, park passive recreation opportunities. Um, I'm seeing some folks are also interested in barbecue areas, horseshoe pits, other kind of similar passive activities. And some people are really minimalist about it, just looking for none of the above, really simple activities. All right, we're gonna cruise on to our next area here. I see a couple more responses coming in. All right, next one. So again, same questions, same activities, uh, but we're now looking down at Woodland Creek and Covington Court. Um, so go ahead, take a moment, add in your responses. We'll see if they differ from what you'd like to see at 31st Ave Extension. Starting to see some similar patterns. A little bit more folks who are saying none of the above. Um, seems like there's a little bit more interest in keeping this area pretty undeveloped. Um, but still, the most people are interested in play areas, picnic tables, shelters, benches. Um, we are seeing a difference here, though. Nobody's really particularly interested in that open space of this area. Um, great, and I see a couple of comments coming in in the Q&A um, for additional explanation. Thanks, that's great. Um, I welcome anyone to do that. 
So let's go ahead and take a look now at Pleasant Glade Park. Same activity, like I mentioned, these four slides all look pretty similar. Um, go ahead and uh, say, tell us what you would like to see at this area. Um, and we'll do this once more again for Hawks Prairie. Similar interest in benches, picnic tables, shelters, play areas. A little bit of interest in open lawn, but I think that we're seeing that those three are pretty dominant, uh, the benches, play areas, and picnic tables um, across the board here. So that's really interesting to see. All right, I'm gonna cruise us on to our fourth and final uh, access area, which is at Hawks Prairie Road. Um, this will be our last engagement before I turn it back over again to our presenters. Um, but please tell me, what do you want here? A lot of interest in benches, play areas, picnic tables, same trends we're seeing elsewhere. Some good interest in barbecue and horseshoe pits as well. I would say this seems like the area where I'm seeing the fewest, none of the above responses. Um, so probably the most interest in development of this space, um, which is helpful, although I saw one more just went in there as well. All right, so I am gonna go ahead and wrap up this engagement section and we'll go back to presenting. Thanks everyone. Okay, um, now let's talk about educational uh, opportunities and what, what that means for this park. Uh, learning and education can be approached in many different ways and scales, uh, especially here at uh, Greg Curio Park and Greenway, since the park offers such a wide range of opportunities due to its ecological richness. Uh, learning opportunities at the park could be integrated in, uh, in as I said, just in a, many different ways uh, we have and scales. So we've identified a like the lowest impact at the top with informal outdoor education and more impactful uh, with, a, with an official environmental learning center um, here on this slide. Um, so the informal outdoor educational uh, nodes opportunities can be scattered throughout the site uh, to offer those opportunities. For instance, it could be an outdoor classroom with, uh, with some seating or interpretive signage. So the middle option um, with having a small multipurpose space uh, can vary in size depending on what partnership opportunities come along and available. It could be an open pavilion, or it could be a um, series of smaller spaces that are configurable uh, within a building to support uh, various types of events. And as mentioned, uh, the Environmental Learning Center would be um, more impactful uh, with, a, with a solid structure uh, that houses a reception area, a couple of offices and uh, classrooms. It could have also an outdoor component to it uh, in, in a form of a canopy bridge or elevated boardwalk, uh, just to expand on uh, the learning opportunities. Again, the three concepts show the different scales of integrating learning opportunities to the park. Um, alternative A on the left takes the lowest impact approach and shows how the small informal outdoor ed educational opportunities are scattered throughout the park. Alternative B in the middle includes a small multipurpose space at the core area uh, of the park. And alternative C on the right includes environmental learning center in the central programmed area. And with that, we have a quick poll question. So back to Julia. Right, here we are. All right, so we have just one question here uh, before we are gonna go back to our presentation. So um, this is speaking just to what we've heard about in terms of the different um, levels of an environmental um, or an educational programming space that we have. 
Um, so I'm seeing some folks are already adding their ideas in, which is fantastic. Um, this, you know, upper left opportunity, the informal outdoor learning areas re really represent sort of the lightest impact or, or sort of most, um, you know, smallest sort of uh, educational area that we might see really just as, uh, as we've heard about just some ben basic benches, outdoor spaces. And then we've got two different scales of actual buildings, either a small multi-purpose space um, or a larger environmental learning center. And I'm seeing the most interest in just having informal outdoor learning areas um, with small, a small multi-purpose space coming up um, you know, close behind. Um, most people are interested in having at least some level of educational programming within the park and greenways, which is really great to see, um, or are not, you know, there's a couple of folks who might not be sure or don't want any of this. Um, but we are seeing a relatively lower impact uh, educational programming opportunity as being uh, the priority for this group. Thanks, everybody. We have one more engagement, but for now, back to our presentation. Uh, I'm going to coin this the minty moment. <laughs> like an announcement session. Um, all right. So uh, next topic we're going to tackle is the environmental protection and restoration. I think there was a comment that somebody uh, put up earlier, too, on why are we not talking about pre um, preservation and protection of the environment and the trees. And so, so we are. Uh, we're at that portion of the meeting now. We've got a couple of slides to show um, some of the really just highlighting certain areas. So as I mentioned in the beginning, all concepts really are geared towards and we've located things in such a way as to preserve those um, and sense those sensitive areas. Um, so trails will all or you know are all kind of skirting edges of buffers, um, only connecting across things uh, where we absolutely have to in order to, um, connect into the major elements, the major locations throughout the park. Um, uh, and when you do do those types of connections, there's a whole process associated with how to do that with a very light footprint. So footbridges, spans that cross up all the way across creeks, boardwalks where we are um, starting to encroach in, or even boardwalks where we have some steeper slopes so we're just not impacting the root zones of those trees. So those are all opportunities that we'll have in lots of different cases all across um, all of the, the park areas. What we've highlighted on this slide is, is two kind of core principles between protection and restoration, um, both important values um, as part of, of acknowledging and supporting the habitat and ecological value that this park and greenways represents. The protection zones are just identifying a couple of the larger sort of quality um, uh, higher quality areas that were identified from our initial visits. Not to say that these are the only ones. Again, we've we've been out and about for a lot of these these areas, but we haven't walked every uh, square foot of, of all 500 acres. Um, but from some of those initial visits, um, really that large circle that you see in the northwest portion of the site is probably one of the highest quality wetland systems that we have in all of the park. And so in all of our options, that's what we're really calling protection zone. It's a large area. We have one small place where we've identified is reasonable to be able to come in fairly easily, have some kind of an overlook that keeps people out of the system, but still allow the education of what this amazing kind of habitat is. Um, and that is the only spot and the only trails and the only anything being proposed in any of our concepts um, for that zone because it is the highest quality that we've found so far. The other areas, those water resource protection zones, those would have extremely limited access and those, in fact, some of those areas might even need to be fenced off just to make sure they're completely protected. Um, in particular, where it's adjacent to a, a higher level of recreation at an edge, you know, and we wanna make sure that separation is really clear. Um, so split rail fences, uh, signage, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and then the other area that we've started to, to look at, um, and we do anticipate potentially more of these areas, is off to um, the west side of Woodland Creek. Um, there's a portion of the property that's a little narrower, that's a, a good kind of high upland value in between two wetland systems. Some of those wetlands might encroach into that area a little bit, but we don't have any trails proposed or anything in that area, um, because that is kind of a really nice quality system to to, to be able to just completely protect. Um, and we don't have, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of anything that we're trying to connect into, into that space, at least as of right now. The restoration areas we highlighted two in particular, and these are existing wetlands, and you can see those that orange, remember that orange represents wetlands and their buffers. They're existing wetlands, but they're lower quality wetlands. 
Now, circles, again, big 10,000 foot level. So no, we would not go into any of the private property adjacent and do any improvements or change anything that's in those private properties. So again, it's just kind of trying to highlight a certain area. Um, but those are areas that are within some core, um, uh, closer to some improvement areas. It's our kind of that core area in the center of the park, as well as just um, some area immediately to the east of Carpenter that um, or this, the, the city is looking at a potential smaller maintenance facility. Um, within those zones, uh, the idea is that as we start to develop um, what might be um, the, the various park improvements over time, we would be able to take that opportunity to actually restore those environments. So they're very low quality. They don't have a lot of habitat value now, but we could actually turn them into something that has a much better, higher value. And this next slide will show you just an example of what that could look like. So existing conditions, um, you can kind of see on the uh, east side of Carpenter, there's a lot of invasives, a lot more blackberries and some kind of wetlands struggling <laughs> within that zone. Um, and then on the west side, you know, we have some wetlands up in those fields. Um, both of those, once you make some improvements in the area, we're coming in and investing in some recreational programming. Part of those projects would be to actually restore, enhance, and potentially create new wetlands to replace some of the functions and the values that are no longer there today. Um, and those are just some examples uh, through the course of the project and as projects are proposed in final design, more of these areas would then be identified in other parts of the park as well. So this last segment we're going to walk you through is that core zone we keep referring to. So this is that white box that you saw on those previous um, those previous plans. Um, you can see the red dashed outline in the lower left hand corner is uh, the, the water conservation zone, um, water protection rights area that we showed you back in the very beginning. Uh, and so what we're showing here is the darker green that you see kind of more the north end of this with all the little white lines is, is really just the trail systems through the, the forested area. The lighter green you see on this area in the background represents that open um, meadow, the meadow and, and what was agricultural use at one point in time. And so we've got three concepts here we're going to kind of walk you through. Uh, so, yep, going into the next slide. Next for slide. The, okay. Yep. <laughs> I thought maybe I paused. <laughs> So, uh, so the playground component in this area um, would be, uh, this is of course the opportunity where, you know, you could have a couple of smaller playgrounds, they could kind of scatter a little bit between um, the open space or they're not necessarily all in one spot either, but we also have the opportunity for maybe more variety of the play values. Um, we heard at the last meeting, we want these to always be have a more natural bent to them. So using more natural materials, um, but we could kind of expand and have more accessibility, um, more universal kind of access us uh, gearing more towards sensory experiences. We've got some opportunities to really um, make it something more significant. Uh, we're showing some pickleball courts in a couple of the options. And so um, again, it's a smaller scale than a tennis. Um, if you think scale wise, you can fit um, two pickleball courts on each tennis courts and they can be multi-purpose or single use as well. So those are some, some ideas and considerations down the road. The next slide shows you some examples of botanical gardens or food forests, community gardens. Um, botanical gardens, uh, again, can be super informal with just some education and some plant IDs. Um, they're intended to be interpretive. You know, they could be highlighting uh, pollinator species or uh, un, you know, native Northwest understory species, highlight some of the really unique flowering ground covers that we have in the Northwest that a lot of people don't know about. Um, they could also be a little bit more ornamental and help balance water-wise, you know, gardening with some of that natural environment. Anything more significant would be only um, developed further with, again, a partner. Um, so the city, you know, would be looking for a partner if it was anything more than just sort of a simple, you know, self-guided tours and, and signage. Um, but the other side of this could also be community gardens and food forests. And so those are some examples of what those look like.
Uh, the event space, we talked a little bit when we were talking about trail programming, about trail events. So this event space, when you look at these, these um, concepts, we'll kind of show uh, is intended to essentially be open lawn, right? So this is a, a large open space. It would be used for those sort of informal activities we talked about earlier, but also would be the staging ground for those um, regional cross country meets. Um, it would be the staging ground for where all the tents come set up for the benefit fun run um, or the charity event or whatever other sort of event um, would ultimately make sense in this um, in this area. And then the idea of structured camping really just being something unique and entirely tied and only tied to if there was some sort of a community space that you would actually rent out. So if there was a multi-purpose space, whether it's part of an education center or just a small community space, the ability to really sort of allow uh, an educational element of this to actually get into that tree canopy itself or get a little bit more rooted in that natural experience. Um, it would be managed, maintained, security, policed, um, and very restricted to only those sorts of events. On the next slide. Uh, what we're calling a multi-use fitness or adventure trail. So the this would be uh, anything from kind of that outdoor fitness equipment, bars, rocks, stumps, logs, things you could use for kind of parkourable uh, fitness kinds of events. Um, and then there's one concept that has what we call, kind of call this adventure trail, and that would be something geared more towards younger kids and families. There's a lot of examples and a very um, increasing interest and need to have something close in uh, where you can park close to playgrounds where you have younger kids, but your older kids are really not at playgrounds anymore. And so it gives a, an area for for them to be able to sort of experience similar to a pump track, but maybe a little bit more varied and a little more multi-purpose. And then the off-leash area, we have a couple of concepts that show off-leash areas and, and concepts that don't. All right, so we are gonna go through a super fun exercise. It might take a little explaining. And the goal here is to kind of think about these different programs and uses and what sort of balance, again, how much space, how much um, of these facilities do we wanna see in, in specifically the central core? Yes, thanks, Juliet. And I am super excited for this one. And I'm also the most nervous about it because like Juliet said, it takes a little bit of explaining. So I hope you'll bear with me. Um, but essentially what we have here listed and what you should be able to see on your screen are all of the different um, options for recreation that we've identified for this main central area in the park. Uh, and so what we're asking for each of you to do is to allocate points um, to each of these areas. We've got 100 points total. Um, and you can basically indicate um, how much space you think each of these activities should take up within this central area um, based off of how many points you allocate for them. Uh, so you should be able to see a plus 10 button. Um, you can sort of add that to on each of these um, so that you have round, you know, rounds of 10 basically, or you can add, um, you can type in a specific number if you want to allocate 17 points to one thing and 32 to another. Um, and so the only thing to note is that your answer must add up to 100. I'm seeing somebody's gung-ho on disc golf right now, which is great. Um, and if you have an idea for something that you'd like to hear in the central area that isn't reflected on this list, Go ahead and allocate space to that by giving the other options some points. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a way to add any kind of open-ended response here. So we'd ask you to just go ahead and do that in the Q&A box. Um, so I'm seeing, this is oh, very exciting. Uh, I see 10 people have successfully done this and seeing a lot of excitement about disc golf, some interest in pickleball courts, um, and a lot of interest in, in a lot of, wow, really actually pretty pretty evenly spread between play areas, dog parks, the multi-use fitness trail, the picnic area. Reminds me of the, um, the uh, shooting games, right? Where you get to sort of see who's further ahead in some of those arcade games that you used to have. I like watching I the reorder, the reorder of things. It's always, it's very exciting. It's also hard to read it all as, it, as it's all coming through, but that's good. We love, <laughs> we love more engagement, so keep them coming in. Um, so I'll give folks just a couple more minutes to add in responses. Juliet, did I see you want to do Yeah, and I was just going to remind everyone as you're kind of looking through this and say, well, you know, where's the, where's the, the none of the above option? Um, this is really just focused in that central area where we have uh, the open meadow. So, so um, you know, aside from the disc golf, which does move along the trails uh, into some of those trees, um, the off-leash area could kind of have maybe a little bit of in forest as well as in the open space. But we're primarily talking about what we could do in that open space area. Thanks, Juliet. 
So I'm seeing about 27 folks have responded, which is close to as many people have been responding throughout this. So I think we're getting close to what we expect. And this is super interesting to see. We've had we've seen a lot of changes throughout. And what I'm noticing here is that you know the, the least popular option of open lawn, the most, you know, that's at six percent. The most popular is at pickleball courts at 15 percent. That's not a huge spread. Um, we're seeing pretty you know strong interest in yeah. all of these options. Um, you know, without any strong strong thing taking the lead is really dominating this central area. Um, so I will go ahead and leave this option open for any last folks who are still adding in their numbers. Um, but this has been super helpful and really exciting to see um, so much strong interest across the board in all of these activities. And I will turn it back to our presenters, um, but I'll leave this open sheet so you should still see it on your screen, but we won't be sharing it uh, here on Zoom. Okay, so we wanted to take a few minutes and just kind of walk through a little bit more where some of the areas of these different activities. So we started off by showing all three, uh, kind of walked you through the examples of what these different activities could look like. And so um, we've got our three concepts, uh, just focusing on that core area. Uh, this first concept is that idea primarily and the open space. Um, I, so let me st actually, let me start off by saying where the entrance is. In all of our concepts, I keep mentioning the primary entrance to the park would be off of Carpenter Road. You've got that black kind of dashed circle uh, kind of towards the middle of the screen here. That would be that primary entrance um, that we're talking about. Uh, 31st Avenue um, would connect uh, over across into Carpenter. There would be some sort of intersection up in the north end there. Um, once you get to the west side of Carpenter, that would turn into a primary trail. There is a desire and a, a potential need to get emergency vehicle access through at some point in the future. But it, at this stage, we're just identifying it as a primary trail connection that would come continue through to Pleasant Glade Road. Um, and you see the dashed lines, the dashed white lines that are more the squiggly ones represent those secondary um, trails. Um, we have two wetlands within the central zone area. They're very small. You can see them with kind of the white hash lines and then the boundaries of their buffers around them. You might recognize our little circle bubbles from those orange graphics that you saw earlier. So everyone comes into the park and all of these options off of Carpenter Road. Um, we come into the site a little bit so we can kind of give some buffer in and around and, and sort of experience that park and, and sort of see those views as you're entering into the park. And then you would have your primary parking. So this primary parking would be sized, ultimately sized to, to kind of suit the uses in the program and the expected um, uh, traffic that we would have coming into this. There's also a traffic analysis that ultimately would go along with any initial phase of construction. So you would identify what other kinds of traffic improvements might be needed along Carpenter or out in the, the, the other connecting roadways that would support the use as we develop an actual use for people to come and, and, and come to the park. This first option then, um, uh, I should also say all of our concepts within that primary parking area would have some amount of just open space, playground, picnic, informal kind of recreation activity that Merritt talked about earlier. Within this particular concept, we're focusing more on the idea of the gardens. So here we have three zones identified. Um, uh, just kind of showing general areas to start off with. Um, if it was all developed as one botanical garden, it would absolutely need to have a partner or some, some outside um, organization, nonprofit, et cetera, to kind of come and support what that could look like. Um, but the idea here is that you would develop the wetland creation, restoration, improve those wetland functions, and that would be one component of that uh, educational garden. Another component could be more ornamental um, or would be, for example, the pollinator species and hummingbird species and things that related a little bit more to the natural environment. Um, you could start an arboretum and start some other kind of interesting ideas and have some trails that would relate to that. And then the yellow area might be more of that food forest community garden, something that would need a little bit more sun, something that would be more centrally focused. We're showing a dog park in this option. So that's area seven to the north. It's kind of the white clouded area in all options, a dog park, if it is something that is continued to be supported or that is supported at all as we move forward is intended is um, shown up next to Carpenter Road. So in this case, we've spanned a little bit more into the forested area and the open space. You'll see an option later on that's really mostly smaller and in the open space. When you get to the east side of this enlargement area, that's where we focus those educational opportunities and the event space. So um, 
part of those white bubbles will key you into what would be uh, into the event area. Open lawn, you know, it would be just for any kind of general pickup informal use for most of the time, but it is sized to support those uh, kind of fun runs and the cross country meets and the things like that that might happen. So that's where that would occur. Um, the road would continue to that area. So once, you know, if there's a future, as a future phase is developed or maybe a secondary phase, uh, you would be able to continue to have access to that area. There would potentially be another parking area. So if there is an event, you have an expanded parking to support those events. And if there's an educational component with an actual structure or building, it would be in that area as well. Um, that's where we could house an actual building, a structure of some kind. And again, it would be uh, serviced by a road and parking and utilities to support that at the time something was ever um, actually developed again with a partner of some kind. This next option, as we move into the next one, um, it shows more courts. So again, we come into a central area, uh, major parking in the open Open space to the south of that parking could potentially be some pickleball courts, um, playground, etc. kind of to the north. Larger space then for open space, again, events um, or just informal recreation, uh, potentially more wetland creation or stormwater type um, facilities, and then uh, an educational center on the far west um, uh, side and the left, the, the left side of the page here. And then in this third option, we've kind of looked at a combination of events. So again, education still stays to that, uh, that left side or the west side of the enlargement area with the open space kind of taking up the central. Here, the disc golf is shifted a little bit more into that open space. So it has a, a little bit more presence in the open space. And then um, the other, you know, some of those holes then uh, go into the woodland area. Um, the uh, dog park is shown in this option, again, up close to the entrance and next to Carpenter Road, um, but it is scaled down a little bit so that we have some room also for some a smaller scale of um, pickleball courts. We didn't really talk about restrooms and utilities. I think there was a question there. Any kind of improvement in this area uh, within the core, uh, we would anticipate having restrooms in those facilities. As you start to get beyond this core area, um, that's where I think some future investment and understanding of where utilities exist um, might occur. 31st is a likely location if that really ends up being a little bit more of a trailhead with some parking and some other secondary activities. We would expect to have more utility access for potentially a second restroom in that area. Pleasant Glade does not, and so we're not really anticipating a restroom in Pleasant Glade and um, no restrooms um, in any of the, the Hawks Prairie or anything down to the south. All of that would then be kind of decided in greater detail and sort of final decisions and alignments and sizes and scales of things as a future um, and uh, a future project was uh, was going into final design. And with that, we're going to open this up for Q&A. I think I've talked a ton. I'm hoping to hear some of you guys talk and give us some of your feedback. Um, so the way we're going to run this is an example. You have your Q&A button in the bottom. Uh, you have been uh, putting in lots of comments. Uh, our folks have been kind of answering some of those as we go, but we can certainly kind of revisit some of those a little bit more and have you expand on some of your thoughts, questions, and concerns. So we're gonna try and do that. Um, and then as you have new questions that come up, we will address those as well. So some logistics, uh, my Zoom, we'll have to see if any of you guys noticed, actually crashed mid-meeting. Uh, and so I was able to come back in you might not have even known I was gone, but I'm back. Um, but what that means for our facilitators is that those early questions up through about where we hit the education and the, um, the access, the informal activities, I can no longer see. So I'm gonna rely on some of my other facilitators, Julia and Merritt here to uh, kind of help identify if there's some comments that maybe didn't get answered or some folks that wanna speak out and have some additional thoughts or comments on their topics to, to call attention to those and, and we'll still be able to find you and, and open the mic up. So the way this works, if I call attention to you, I'll give you a cue that I'm gonna be uh, seeing if you wanna mic up. Um, we'll be able to give you the opportunity to unmute yourself. You're gonna see like a little button kind of pop up and, and say, would you like to unmute yourself? Once you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. 
Um, we're going to try and keep it somewhat short. We'll see how many people are really interested in providing some additional feedback. So to start us off, um, I did hear one question really about um, phasing. So for example, I think the question was specifically, gee, is when would anything actually ever get built in Covington court um, or you know, either whether it's Hawks Prairie or Covington or any of these sort of secondary access points? And would the community be involved before anything would actually go to construction? Jen or Ashley, uh, maybe one of you can kind of and I'll talk a little bit more about that process and that future public involvement. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to take this one. Um, you know, our commitment is definitely to work with the neighborhoods moving forward um, as the project it is definitely a long-term project. I think everybody knows that. And so um, really the focus, as you've stated um, several times, Juliet, is that really that core area and the main entrance west of Carpenter as a first phase. And then as we move forward, uh, it would be, yes, uh, interacting with the neighborhoods and seeing if there's any, um, you know, new information that might be applicable, um, just reviewing that with the stakeholders that are adjacent uh, to the areas. So that is the city's commitment moving forward. Does that answer the question? I think so. Um, let's we can what I'll do is for the the folks that asked that question, we're going to kind of find you in here and we'll give you a chance in a little bit to, uh, to mic you and uh, and see if that answered the question. The only other thing I would say is is phasing and priorities is something we are going to address as part of this master plan. So this particular meeting is about what do we want to include and what should that master plan look like. But our next meeting will then take and try to and get priorities for what would actually be built first. Typically in a master plan of this scale, it truly is a 20 plus year vision. Um, there is no single funding source that's gonna even remotely build you know, everything all at once. Um, and so we would sort of expect the, the bulk likely of that first phase to be more in that core area, um, but we will give an opportunity for more public input on that. Um, so Douglas Coiner, oh, I should also say, I'm super sorry if I mispronounce names, I'm going to do the best I can, but um, please bear with me. Uh, so I think you, you had kind of an interesting question about why, why we're having something over on 31st Avenue and kind of the relationship between recreation and um, uh, and those neighbors, uh, you know, just providing services and, and activities adjacent to neighbors. And there's kind of two sides to this. I'm gonna try and find you and give you a chance to sort of speak. I had you in my sights and then I lost you. So here we go. And I'm gonna ask some help from Kelly here. I'll unmute myself. Perfect. Do you want to expand a little bit more on your comment and concern with some of the ideas around 31st Avenue? Certainly. The D.R. Horton housing project there is one of the most densely packed residential neighborhoods that I've ever seen. I mean, there's hardly any, there's maybe five feet between the houses themselves. And to put a a recreation area that would draw more people in the area um, I'm, I'm just interested in your reasoning for doing that because it would seem that you wouldn't want to attract more people to an area that is already so densely populated with people who might not want to hear people picnicking and playing games. So that's a, certainly an interesting kind of perspective to it. And there's actually someone else who is talking about the noise level. So Jenny, maybe uh, stay tuned. Jenny uh, Gessler, we might uh, see if you want to add some comments to this in a few minutes, since I think noise was certainly a topic that you had mentioned as well. Um, when you start looking into recreation improvements, particularly when you have that kind of a density, um, and whether that's in the new development, or I know some of the neighborhoods uh, kind of north of that and, and off of the Hawks Prairie Road also have a, a little bit more density and, and different kinds of housing, and some of those houses are a little closer together. Sometimes that's actually where you do want recreation activities. Those are folks who maybe don't have as much access as uh, residences or homes that have a lot more opportunity with their own backyards. Um, when 
one thing this does afford us is that with that 31st Avenue kind of cutting through, we have the opportunity to sort of put this in a, in a space that would have enough buffer to those residences that you're not kind of right backed up right next to them. So things, you know, and this is why 31st was identified as maybe a slightly more um, kind of a trailhead type um, facility with parking, because we do want to allow folks from some of the more denser neighborhoods that are quickly developing in the gateway and in that um, adjacent neighborhood and even up around the Hawks Prairie area to have access and to be able to come and park and just really get on, get onto those trail systems. Um, I think a good question is how much, how much other activity would occur at that location? It could be just a small parking lot and trail access, or it could have some of those other picnics and maybe a small tot lot or something to that extent. I'd love to kind of hear from some other folks that might think um, either that that uh, is not a good place or if maybe we feel that, that for some of people who live in those areas that it, it might actually have some merit. That's one of those things that I think could be, uh, we could hear from both ways. Uh, let's see if we can find Jenny and see if that's similar to the comment that you had started to raise. So Jenny Gessler. Can you hear me? Yep, we sure can. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge, unfortunately, I, I'm a huge proponent of outdoor recreation and very active myself. Um, dog mom and husband and I are constantly outdoors recreating, but of course there's a difference for me because I live in this peaceful, tranquil area that is now going to, at some point, transition to what Douglas said about barbecuing and kids. And I mean, it's, it's hard, I think for you all to understand, unless we could bring you into our backyards here in our neighborhood and you could fully experience how often the only thing I hear in the distance is maybe some kids in the gateway neighborhood, but mostly birds and, and just simply the stillness of nature. So that's where my reservation in providing activity adjacent to home areas that, you know, ups our noise level comes from. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your comments and feedback. I think it does kind of go to show maybe some, some thoughtfulness uh, on the part about what is an appropriate buffer so that it doesn't feel like it's in your backyard. And I think we're, we're going to have to kind of explore that a little bit more as well. Um, I believe I saw some comments about Covington Court, uh, Doug Stolhand, um, and Kelly, if you could keep helping to, to unmute these guys, I am not able to, maybe it's something when I crashed, I can no longer have that function. So if you can find Doug, Doug, I, it sounds like you kind of have a similar view if you want to maybe express your opinions to the group. Yeah, are you there? Yep, we sure are. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with uh, Jenny on that. The, the area here is one where, um, you know, the neighborhood is such that we, you know, we're enjoying nature, we're loving nature, we're loving seeing what is going on with nature. And, you know, we butt up to the Woodland Creek. And um, there's a green belt all along here that, you know, we're not allowed to, to touch or to, you know, do anything to because of the salmon and protecting the salmon. And there's been such an emphasis on that over the years that the residents in here have a real high regard and respect for the creek and for nature all around us. And kind of sounds like what you're proposing is the exact opposite of that, to come in and even to say, well, we're going to put bridges and some things over the creek and it's not going to damage the creek. But, but I mean, literally, it's been, no, if something falls across the creek, you can't touch it, you can't take it out, it has to stay in, and it creates this natural habitat. And so, you know, we're living in a place right now where it just feels idyllic from the sense of um, being able to enjoy the creation and enjoy what's all around us. And it's an incredibly peaceful spot. And, um, and so the proposal of bringing in pickleball or bringing in events and bringing in a, a high, high density or high, high noise possibility of folks into the area it just, it, it just smacks of, you know, why many of us live here, why many of us move here. So I appreciate you all taking our input and stuff on this. And, you know, I, my own feelings are if you can keep it as natural as possible with, you know, the hiking trails and those kind of things, that seems to fit with what you've already said about the wetlands and seems with what, what you've said about being low impact and seems to fit with those things. 
but bringing in some of the higher profile type things and the noise issues just kind of flies in the face of why many of us live here. So I guess I appreciate what you guys are doing and trying to do here and all and, um, and just even taking the input. So thank you. You bet. Thanks for, thanks for talking to us. Um, and I think, you know, as we, you know, as, as I look at some of these, I think there's a lot of similar sentiments um, to what you three have kind of talked about. And, and it gets to me to the proximity, how close some of these things are, how how much noise might be generated by some of these activities. And that is something I think, you know, if we kind of, you go stand, you know, in the, the Woodland Creek neighborhood or up towards the Hawks Prairie neighborhood and someone's in, in Carpenter, you know, and those, the, the, the cars that kind of go up and down Carpenter relatively fast right now. And really how far does some of that noise carry? I think, um, you know, focusing, I, I'm hearing more and more that if there is any sort of activity that has that noise, focusing it in more on that central area where you're not adjacent to neighbors, where it's not going to be as, as noticeable, where you have, hun you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet of, um, uh, of, of buffer to really kind of protect them. That's sort of where, where I'm, I'm hearing. Or, of course, the flip side, I think, as some of you have mentioned, is nothing at all. Um, I think the idea of having this opportunity and having some level of recreation is, is kind of a core principle to this park. But where we locate it and how it's done, I think, is something that's definitely open for discussion. Um, I, I did see, see another one. Did, I Jen see a hand up. Ashley, do you guys want to talk to that, that point? Juliet, we've had a hand up from Teresa for a little while. I'm not sure if you still have a question or comment. Awesome. So Kelly, can we find Teresa and allow her an opportunity to speak? You should be able to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. I think that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, we also had a question, um, a disc golf question about the gold level course. I don't know if John Anderson wants to speak or I can read the question. Yeah, let's see, John, if we can find you on here and give you a second to speak and, oh man, Kelly is fast. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. I think we can hear you, give it a shot. I can hear background, but I can't hear you speaking. Okay, let me read the question. So go ahead and read the question and we'll see if you can, if you, if you find kind of that you can have a voice in here, go ahead and shout out John and we can, uh, don't worry about interrupting us. So Jen, go ahead and read us the question. Um, okay, so he's asking, it's great to see disc golf as a component of the park. How many acres are being shown to be used by disc golf course? In general, a gold level requires more length than a typical disc golf course. So comparing, um, you know, we do have a junior course at Woodland Creek Park. And so comparing, uh, he's making a note of comparison there. Comparing so. in the space. Do we have a and rough, I will tell you, yeah, um, rough acreage estimate? Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe Mary, if you have some rough ideas, um, the, the botanical garden kind of space with those three colors you sort of see in the map we're marking up was about 20 acres. So if you think about our kind of blobs of um, the expansion course being 18 holes uh, roughly and maybe not quite that much, but sort of a similar size. Um, again, I think that the detail of how it's laid out, where it's at and, and the space between you know, actual um, holes and baskets. You can see I'm not even quite the, the person who knows all the terminology to it or not. Um, we're showing it super conceptual just to indicate that there is an activity and a use. We have not really spent time at this master plan level to figure out the length of, the, of, of each run, uh, the, the par or the T or really you know, any of that kind of detail, more just conceptually that it would occur within this general area. Um, within the central park. So somewhere in the 20-ish acres to, um, to for every 18 holes is kind of the space allocated right now. And that would certainly be amendable to smaller or larger, depending on, on how it would ultimately lay out. Julia, it looks like John has his hand up if he's able to, to talk. Yeah, give it a shot, John. Am I on? Yes, you are, thank you. Um, thanks for answering the question that, um, that it's not very a detailed amount of acreage for uh, disc golf. Um, but typically just from my experience, 
with the disc golf, um, if it's in woods, as far as a lot of, uh, a lot of trees to go around and stuff about one acre per hole is very doable as far as a gold level course. So just to let you know, and then if you have any questions about disc golf and distances and how to design it, um, I'm, I'm available. So thank you. That's awesome. So we were thinking, so right now we've got 20 acres per 18 holes. So 18 in the core area and then another 18 kind of in a secondary area somewhere within the park. So those two areas combined would then be long-term what that gold, gold level course would be. There's another hand up by Thomas Johnson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, so uh, I want to be kind of the counter to this uh, disc golf uh, talk. Uh, I think there's probably a few of us that um, were in there also wondering why, why disc golf is such a priority when it seems like it's uh, – it's an activity that takes a lot of space, as John just mentioned, um, for probably a fraction of Lacey residents. Thank you. Certainly. Jen, do you want to kind of start off with that one and in, in sort of the background and what you've been hearing from the community too? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, yeah, so we've had, you know, disc golf, uh, a lot of involvement from the local, the South Puget Sound Disc Golf Association in the community in providing feedback and also um, actually uh, working in partnership with the city at our, the current Woodland Creek uh, Junior Course site um, that is currently existing. It is a definitely a growing sport. Um, it tends to be more on the passive side. It works well with other park uses. Um, for example, you could have a cross country course that is overlaid on top of a disc golf course, um, uh, just as an example. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's something that I've been here four and a half years and the disc golf um, community has been very active and involved, not only in just coming to meetings. That was one of the comments that was on the, um, the Q and A not only in the meetings, but also out there in the community and actually helping to take care of the course and teaching and educating about the sport and the um, multi, the wellness aspect of it is pretty important. The multi-generational type uses that can occur, you know, um, grandparents being able to go participate with their grandchildren, um, just all ages. It's, it's a very uh, community, community oriented type of recreational activity. Yeah, can often be very social as well. Um, and I think this gets to something we didn't really talk a lot about when we were looking at the rankings of the various activities from our first uh, our first open house. Disc golf actually ranked kind of in the middle. So there was quite a few people who had mentioned it, um, but I always like to compare things like disc golf or, or even like zip lines or climbing and, and fitness areas. Um, you know, things that are maybe not that universally used. Um, trails always end up at the highest list of priorities, almost always, because they're used by so many of us. It's anyone can kind of go walk a trail and it's so accessible and easy to use. And that's one of the reasons they're so great. Things like disc golf, um, dog parks, uh, kind of equate to like ball fields or um, uh, a truly universally accessible playground or even ADA access to some extent, right? The segment of the population who truly needs it might be much smaller, but it doesn't mean there's not still value to providing them. And so part of a citywide resource, and I think there was even a comment about how did you look citywide and looking at adjacent neighboring um, uh, recreation activities that are available as well. Um, and we do, we sort of look at what's available nearby what's in the city as a whole and what might make sense that we could kind of partner with this. Ball fields do not make sense at this park at all. So we're looking for citywide needs that actually could partner well with the type of environment that we have. And that's one of the reasons that disc golf did come up because we can, it, it, yes, it's got a lot of space, but it's a long miles in, of trails, right? It's, it's not like a single dedicated use. It's something that you almost don't even notice is there unless there's a tournament, in which case you're gonna see a lot more people and wonder what they're doing out there. Do we have any other hands up? That's been a pretty uh, easy way for, for folks to kind of let us know that you're interested in speaking or offering some opinions.
Um, and as we kind of look at that, there's a question in here, and I think there was a, a thumbs up for it as well about barbecue areas. And so a question about barbecue areas and uh, and and are they a fire hazard? Are they even allowed? Um, how are burn bans enforced? Jen, do you kind of have some policy and some um, kind of background on that? Yeah, sure. So currently uh, we have designated barbecue areas and um, that is where we do require barbecues to take place in the parks. And, uh, you know, the only time we don't, we don't currently have a burn ban. And if that was something that we needed to take a look at, we would, um, that's not something that we've done in Lacey parks before, but you know, as, as our weather changes, it might be something that we have to look at in the future. I know that state parks, um, you know, has, has burn bans. Um, so we would definitely, especially with the, if there was a group overnight camping area, that's something we would have to look at for this site as well. Um, but currently there, you know, there are no fires allowed in the parks at all and barbecuing is in designated areas. So we would need to designate those. Okay. Uh, there was also a question I think uh, was answered online, but I want to bring it up because it might be um, more folks interested in hearing about. There was a question about um, restrooms. If there are restrooms, are they locked? How does the city kind of address vandalism, homelessness, safety, and security of parks once something is developed? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, there is currently no overnight use of any of Lacey's parks, so that wouldn't change unless of course, there was a designated structured, you know, group uh, camping area that was fully staffed. That's something that the city would would most likely need to contract with, um, an, you know, another group to, to operate that. Um, but as far as uh, the park hours, they are 7 a.m. until dark and all of the restrooms and park gates are locked and unlocked as close to those times as possible. Um, we do have a a uh, contract for a security service that we utilize for that. Um, they do a great job with our current facilities. And then regards to homelessness, you know, we do have quite a lengthy um, uh, write up about the city's response to homelessness. And that's on the project website under the frequently asked questions. And we actually are just updating that with some new information that the police chief has um, provided. So does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. That was a pretty good response. And like, I think as Jen said, if you go onto a website, um, we've heard a lot about concerns about safety, security, uh, traffic, um, all of that sort of thing as you come through, as anything is developed. Uh, so I encourage you to kind of go to the website and look at that frequently asked questions. Um, and of course, email us if you still have uh, additional questions beyond that. Yeah, and I'll, um, add, yeah, I'll add, I did, you know, um, did mention at the last workshop, and I'll mention it again, is that we do really, I mean, we do find people who are trying to camp in the parks and we do respond quite quickly to those. And that can either be a park patron who gives us a call, lets us know that they see something in the bushes or a neighbor. I mean, we partner with neighbors all the time at our current locations, um, 1200 acres total of park, Lacey Parks system. And so you can imagine we do have a lot of neighbors that we work with and really, really appreciate the eyes and ears. Um, uh, on that sort of thing. And I'll mention, I will call out the disc golf group since we were talking about them. They've helped us find a few campers in Woodland Creek Park and uh, make sure we act quickly on that. So it's nice to have eyes and ears out there. Um, I saw a couple of comments for like in support of a dog park and a couple of comments opposed to a dog park. I'd, I'd love to hear from the, the folks in attendance a little bit more about your thoughts on that, either why you think it's a good idea or why you're concerned about it. So uh, if you'd be willing to share some thoughts, if you can raise your hand, um, do the little raise hand button or type in a, a new quick little, hey, I've got, a, I've got an opinion into the Q&A chat and we can call attention to you and, um, and give you an opportunity to speak. Um, and while we do that, um, the next topic I kind of wanted to talk through is there's a good question, Douglas, I think you spoke earlier today, but um, you had mentioned noticing that hiking paths and mountain biking trails cross paths at certain point, who has the right of way? Um, it is usually a policy that gets set. Uh, it is often part of signage, um, particularly in this case, because it's a designated area for mountain biking, there'd be some kind of rules and right of way and often with infographics. So younger riders can understand who has the right of way. Um, usually pedestrians have the right of way. So as the mountain bike, pedestrians are identified when it's a mountain bike trail. 
Um, and when it's not a mountain bike trail, the mountain bike trail that crosses the, the, the primary pedestrian trail would then stop uh, and uh, pedestrians have the right of way through there. On the mountain bike trail itself, it could go either way. So it kind of depends on how the city wanted to develop that policy um, and, and how family friendly um, that, uh, that area really is intended to be. The more family friendly, the more we sort of uh, do a share, share the road kind of approach so that um, you, do, you do yield. To, uh, to pedestrians because you have those little kids who sometimes are trying to figure out what to do and you don't want to have the mountain biker cruising through a little too fast. Um, let's see, do we have anyone uh, hands raised or uh, interest in speaking more about the dog park? All right, not seeing anything unless you folks do. Um, um, Hi, Julia. I'm sorry to interrupt oh. you. We have two. We have Leroy Gay and Thomas Johnson. Oh, great. Can you go ahead and uh, we'll eventually do hit both of you, but go ahead, Leroy. You should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you, Kelly. Oh, good. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Yeah. I don't know if I'm a big fan of dog parks, but I see a big use for one in here. You know, I'm at I go to McAllister Park every once in a while and goof around there some, and you see a billion dogs walking off leash. It's not an off leash dog park, but you just see a lot of people do it. And so a park this size with so much acreage, if you have a small area used for a dog park and you see somebody walking off leash someplace else, you don't have to be confrontational about it, but you could kind of call, go up to them and go, oh, you must be confused where the dog park is and you can point it out to them, you know? And that way, maybe you can get all the off-leash people into the dog park. So I, I see a need for a dog park. Thanks. That's a really great point, Leroy. Thanks for, for sharing with us. And Thomas, do you wanna chime in on this topic? <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm obviously a, a dog owner. I have. Two, two great dogs and they're, my wife and I walk them very often through that space right now off leash and they love it. Uh, they love, you know, being able to be dogs and, and run around and sniff and things like that, you know, and a, a dog park at McAllister is just a big empty space. There's no, there's no shade. There's no place to really enjoy other than, you know, just take your dogs to go poop, I guess, or something. And in response to some other concerns, I mean, I understand that some people are, are irresponsible and don't pick up after their dogs, but many of us, and I would even say maybe most of us do are responsible and pick up after our dogs. And, uh, you know, especially if there's facilities there, you know, the little dog, uh, dog poop little bags dog or whatever. Right, right. Um, but the whole point of, a, of an off-leash area, which, um, you know, is that that's, that's, uh, that's the dog's area, you know, and if, if you're in there and you're not a dog owner, then what are you doing there? Like, so I don't really understand the concerns as far as like dog poop and other things. Well, I, I think he was talking about the uh, surrounding. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, um, hope, okay. hope that made sense. Yeah, I think so. And I think um, we showed two concepts, one where it's a little more in the open space and one where it spanned more into the forested area. I'm also gonna infer that if there is one, you'd prefer one that expanded a little bit into the forested area. So you have some variety, right? You can actually have some trails within the off-leash dog area that you could walk with your dog. So it gives you that, that uh, varied experience. Absolutely, yes. yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good, I always sometimes like to reiterate to make sure I'm interpreting some of what I'm hearing right. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. I did. I got excited about the dog stuff. So I got lost my track. I do want to hear a little bit more about education components. And so we showed those three, uh, examples. Uh, it looked like the majority of people were really sort of for some level of, of, um, of education, uh, but, uh, not so much for a larger environmental learning center, maybe for a smaller activity area? Is there, for those of you that participated or maybe had some thoughts about the educational component and if a building, you know, kind of fits with the scale of activity or not, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you. 
So we'll try to, so the, the raise hand, while it's not shown on a little graphic, um, I don't actually get to see the hand, but there should be a hand um, that you can raise, or again, just type in as a new, uh, a new comment on that QA button and we can pull you out of the, the Q&A discussion as well. Um, and there were a couple of questions where there are folks that said don't know or maybe not or maybe those those don't know um, responses were really a none of the above. Um, if you've got kind of some some additional feedback on why you selected something, this would be a great time to hear from you on those as well. Leroy, uh, has Leroy yep, go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I selected the medium building. Um, that's most for the educational ideas and stuff, but, you know, in Lacey, we don't have a nice park with, you know, I don't know how to say it, but, you know, surroundings where uh, people may want to go for weddings. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, I think like the Rose Garden in uh, Olympia and things like this. So, yeah, it would be kind of nice maybe to have a structure to support that, a pavilion, maybe something that might optional for roof in case it's a rainy day or something like that. But, you know, I, I think it'd be really neat for Lacey itself to, to have something that would kind of showcase Lacey where this is an area people may want to have a wedding at. So that's, that's why I collected the you, meeting building. I'm but, hearing from you that maybe with walls, maybe without walls, that it just is kind of more about creating a place that's protected from weather that you could host some events. Right, and it's kind of pretty and something like this is where we like to get some bride and groom pictures taken. It kind of looks kind of, you know, romantic, flowers, I don't know, you know, just yeah. ideas. You get um, uh, uh, reunions, you know, even smaller family reunions when you, you know, where we rain an awful lot, sometimes just having that, <laughs> that assurance that it's gonna be. Exactly covered yeah. that's a, a use um it could be totally sometimes photos walls. just high school photo shoots too happen in a lot of places there's a park that we uh have done some a lot of work in in pierce county that every the high every high school senior goes to this park because it's got this great sort of structure barn background and that's where they do senior photos all the time so i i think it's as much about the ambiance as the physical structure itself is what i'm hearing from you right right Cool. We, we also received a comment from an anonymous attendee that says that if the emphasis on restoration, botanical garden, and salmon habitat, a larger environmental learning center does make sense. Okay. Those are some great feedback as well. Thank you, Leroy, for volunteering. Do we have other questions? I know we talked for an awful lot and we kind of got a lot of feedback through our um, our live polling and our minty moments. I know we're also pushing up towards the end of our meeting time that was allotted. So I'll give a shout out if there are any topics that we didn't address, uh, maybe questions answered that you didn't quite answer well enough or that you have some additional comments on, now would be the time. Okay, let's go back to our um, presentation here and we're going to we're going to close with just a couple of minutes on some next steps. I have one hand up, Juliet, real quick. Oh, thank you. Teresa. Teresa. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself and Okay, got it. Sorry. Yep, it's real this time. Um, I was wondering, I, we missed half the meeting, but did you mention anything? Was there any possibility of horseback riding trails included or was that not possible? We, yeah, we did show, um, it came up at our first open house as well. Um, the city currently has a policy that does not allow horseback riding citywide. Um, so between that, um, uh, at this point, it was not something that was proposed for the park master plan. I think we started looking a little bit when we saw that about other areas where horseback riding is allowed. There's actually a couple of larger parks in Pierce County while they're further away from Lacey. Um, there is some larger areas nearby it, somewhat nearby, um, but nothing in Lacey itself. Okay. We have, um, we have one Julia. more hand raised. Yep. John looks like. Cool. 
Go ahead, John. Can't hear you yet, although it does look like you're unmuted. Can you, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, we can. OK. Um, so there's like 100 acres for sale right next to the park <laughs> right now. I don't know if you've seen this on Redfin or Zillow. Um, any money left over to buy that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that one. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Um, I yeah, I think that you know there, these opportunities pop up throughout our park system, and it's it's a challenge. And so if you if you look at our um, the 2017 Parks and Recreation Comprehensive Plan, you'll see that um, a sustainable funding source for parks is definitely a challenge, especially as we uh, you know try to get people out onto the properties that are already owned. Um, by the public. Uh, so the priority in the past priorities have been to acquire properties for the parks department and Lacey has done such a great job of getting these properties in different areas of the city. And now the challenge is to uh, have sustainable funding to be able to, you know, operate, continue to operate these, these spaces, keep up with infrastructure needs. And then also, like I said, get people out onto the properties that are already owned by the public. So this, this park is a great example, you know, instead of uh, using monies to um, make the space bigger is focusing on development, whether that's passive or very minimal um, on up to more of the, you know, the more active developed spots. So that is a huge challenge. And it's, it's tough because these opportunities do come up, like I said, and it, it would be great, um, but you know, it, it, the city has to be very selective, especially when faced with a challenge such as we have in front of us for parks. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, so what we've got up on the screen right now is our little we are here spot. Uh, we're about halfway through our process. Um, what we're trying to do from this meeting is we're going to take your feedback. Uh, we'll show you where you can go and give you a QL code to take that online survey. You'll see some very similar questions, um, maybe organized slightly differently to what you did tonight. We do ask that you still go um, quickly take the survey. It really shouldn't take more than that five or 10 minutes and you'll know all about the, the background and the context, so it should be even quicker. Um, we're going to take all that feedback and we're going to try and distill it into a single preferred master plan. And so in that November meeting is our next meeting time. Um, we don't have a specific date yet. Uh, we're kind of looking at where it might make the most sense. So stay tuned. Um, that November meeting is where we would show you the preferred master plan based on what we've heard um, here, based on what our uh, Parks Commission has, has recommended to us. Uh, and then we're gonna ask you probably some priorities of, of one, did we get it right? Is Did we find the right balance to all the, the noise and the buffers, um, recreation while still protecting the environment? Um, it certainly is a challenge in and of itself. So we're gonna ask you what you think about how we interpreted your feedback. And then we're also gonna um, ask you about um, some priorities for an initial phase of construction. Uh, and then the next slide we have here is just a reminder of where you can go to stay informed. Um, this will be available on our website. So if you haven't already, take a quick snapshot of the website. You can also just do a Google search and find it pretty easily. And the last slide is uh, for our survey. So we've got our QR code. Uh, that you can take a kind of hover with your, your camera, should take you directly to the survey, um, or you can log in uh, through uh, the SurveyMonkey format that we use uh, and be able to take the online survey. As always, if, if you have questions, feedback, if this meeting format worked, or if you have some ideas um, of how we can continue to engage and, and keep the community involved in the process, uh, please do reach out and you see the email in front of you. Any last words, Jen, Ashley? Well, I'll just uh, take the opportunity to say thank you once again for your engagement. We really appreciate um, you taking the time with us this evening. So we look forward to working, continuing to work with you on this project. 
All right. And with that, we will close it out. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating uh, and lasting as long as you did. <laughs> it's a lot of information. So the next one should go a little quicker with one concept instead of lots of variations of alternatives. Um, uh, and we look forward to kind of uh, working with you on doing that. Everyone have a good night. Good night.